All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, welcome, Jonathan. Um, and before Jonathan gives his intro about himself and Cloud Peak Law, I just wanted to give some context uh, for the Rocket Dollar customers uh, while we're having this conversation today. Um, one of the many frequently asked questions that can sometimes be a little bit of a doozy is asset protection that our customers ask about. They might be investing in a whole variety of assets. This often comes up with real estate and crypto. Um, you know, maybe they've had a family law situation. Maybe they had a lawsuit in the past. Uh, maybe they're, you know, they've been a landlord for a while and have, you know, butted heads with a tenant and that got to the courtroom. Um, so, you know, many of our customers ask questions about, you know, what are certain LLC protections? Um, Retirement account protections and IRAs and solo 401ks are a little bit different than just a standard LLC. How do those apply? And in my selfish, um, the selfish reasons for having this conversation, a lot of these conversations kind of hit above the sales team pay grade, as we say. It gets a little bit close to um, uh, tax and legal advice that we're not really qualified to give. And obviously, this conversation here is not legal advice, but we're going to have a great discussion today about a lot of things related to asset protections, Colorado LLCs, Wyoming LLCs, and many, many of our customers open LLCs in Delaware, Florida, uh, Nevada is another popular one. Um, and so I wanted to have this conversation to give an overall uh, intro to what asset protection is, and then also kind of dive into some of the hot topics in real estate and crypto for our customers. So Jonathan, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and kind of Cloud Peak Law, everything that you're working on over there. Yeah, well, 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 thank you for having me here today. Really excited to talk to uh, all the listeners. Cloud Peak Law is uh, the umbrella organization, and uh, it's a law firm based in Sheridan, Wyoming. Um, we focus on uh, really entity formations as being the core starting place for many of our customers. We're able to do entity formations in all 50 states, including Colorado, including Wyoming, uh, New Mexico, Florida, you know, we have larger operations uh, there as well as Delaware. On a monthly basis, we're forming about 1,500 uh, LLCs for our clients. And um, we operate under uh, a, a number of different sort of sub brands Wyoming LLC attorney, Colorado LLC attorney, uh, Cindy's New Mexico, Cindy's Florida, um, as, as well as some others. Um, we uh, uh, really try to be as efficient as possible, uh, providing our clients with a really easy understanding of how to open their LLCs, helping them get EINs, giving them great documents related to those entities, and then providing them with uh, ongoing support services, uh, things that are really sort of close to the law, but don't require a lawyer, just, just giving the client some guidance about how to proceed. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to uh, the uh, uh, LLCs under 401ks or uh, LLs or IRAs. Uh, we have uh, great documents to assist our, our clients with um, and um, are, are there to provide some ongoing advice to them, both from a, a tax perspective as well as a legal perspective whenever it's needed. Okay. And, um, you know, Jonathan, we always like to start kind of intro level uh, at the beginning of our webinars, and then we slowly move up to the more complex topics through the hour. So could you just go into, you know, why someone would open an LLC and why some of those liability protections are important? Yeah, the, the uh, uh, LLC stands for Limited Liability Company. And uh, the, the goal is to create a uh, a, a separate, almost a separate person. And that person, uh, and, and in the eyes of the law, is responsible for what happens because of the LLC's activities. So if a, uh, a properly formed LLC that's properly maintained uh, has a lawsuit against it, the hope is, if you've done every, everything right, that the liability will be limited to that entity itself. So if the LLC owns a piece of property, the liability would only be imposed on that piece of property. That should be the maximum that anyone suing that LLC should be able to get. They shouldn't be able to come sue the company and then as a door number two, come and get my car and my home and my checking account. Um, it should be limited to that entity itself. Now, uh, uh, there's th th there are ways that uh, uh, the courts have a, a sort of given um, people who want to sue an LLC, a way to get more when they, they, they aren't fully um, 
uh, satisfied with the amount they can get from the LLC itself, uh, they potentially can pierce the veil of the entity. Uh, this is sort of the worst nightmare of a, of a person who sets up a limited liability company. They're hoping that they're going to be able to protect their personal assets from claims against the LLC. Each state's laws are different. Um, in Colorado, there's sort of a laundry list of uh, different things that a judge can use to come up with a sort of an equitable result that potentially allows the plaintiff to pierce the veil and get to the owner's assets. Um, you know, we can go into those in detail. Those are fairly rare. Uh, different states have sort of different hurdles that a plaintiff's going to have to jump over in order to get to the assets of the members. Uh, but uh, Colorado is, is, is not terrible, but it's not out of the question uh, uh, mm -hmm. that a plaintiff against an LLC can actually get to the assets of, of the owner. And in this case, in the case of 401k LLCs or IRA LLCs, you know, that could be pretty damaging if on the other side of your LLC is a big pot of, of gold and securities and crypto and, and all sorts of other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so that pierce the pierce the veil term, that is a buzzword sometimes when Rockefeller customers, they've just mm -hmm. started to research this. They might have looked at that term, tried to Google it, trying to figure out uh, what's behind that. So maybe could you go in a little bit about what those procedures are in Colorado? And then uh, we had a Q&A question come in. Yeah. Uh, so so at, at the heart of uh, veil piercing, um, there, there's a, a, a number of different elements that a plaintiff is going to have to sort of tick off in order to be able to pierce the veil in Colorado. Um, uh, some of the factors, and I'll, I'll sort of give you some of them here. It's, you know, does the LLC operate as a distinct business entity from its owner? Does the entity commingle funds and assets with any other entity or the members? So at, as I'm reading through these, if you can think about a situation where the one of these things may have occurred uh, in relation to your LLC, you're potentially opening yourself up to a veil piercing. Do they maintain adequate corporate records, right? So is this a real business? At the end of the day, someone looking at it, did they think it's just the owner's alter ego? Or do they think that, or is it, is it really an actual business, separate and distinct, okay? Mm -hmm. Is it a mere shell is another thing, right? It doesn't have any assets. It is only a liability protection vehicle. That's, that's something okay. that can come into play. Is it thinly capitalized? And I see this frequently where uh, with rental properties uh, uh, or operating businesses where every last nickel of profit is pulled out of the company almost immediately. So there's nothing left. All, there's, all that's left there is, is sort of debts. Maybe there's some cash flow that comes in, but it's immediately siphoned off. Are legal, formal, uh, legal uh, formalities disregarded? You know, one of the big ones there is, is it kept in good standing with the Secretary of State? Does it have a registered agent? Has it sort of ticked all of those boxes? And then is it being used for non uh, LLC purposes, right? Is it, uh, uh, and, and, and this has happened frequently where, you know, folks will use the company vehicle and, and it's not really for company, company purposes. They're using it to run around town for their family. Um, uh, and, and another thing that, that they're going to need to find though is, you know, there was some sort of wrongdoing. Uh, that occurred. So was the LLC or this fiction of a of limited liability used to perpetrate a fraud or defeat a rightful claim? Mm -hmm. You know, that one, I'm assuming that everyone is an upstanding member of the business community, and it, they're not using these to perpetrate a fraud. If uh, if you're perpetrating fraud, well, you deserve what you get in, in my eyes, and um, uh, they should be able to come after you as an individual. So it, it, the, the, the final element in um, in Colorado is going to be would disregarding the entity achieve an equitable result, right? So is it that this plaintiff is really not being compensated for the harm that they suffered? Uh, there was no insurance. There, the, the, the entity really has no assets at all, but it did inflict some harm on someone. And really the only way to make that person whole is to go to the member. And, and I sort of use a, you know, a, a, a widows and orphans kind of plaintiff here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a very sympathetic plaintiff that was harmed by your LLC, I think the risk of a veil piercing goes up that uh, potentially your personal assets can be on the line. And, and I, I always recommend, you know, try, absolutely try, try the best you, you can. Don't harm anyone. Keep your buildings in good repair. Make sure they're properly maintained. Make sure they're uh, 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 are up to code. 
all of the basic things that you do, and then have an insurance policy in place as well. If a plaintiff, it, it wasn't just gross negligence that the owner of the LLC sort of uh, um, uh, inflicted upon this individual, if there's an insurance policy there, it's very unlikely that it's going to lead to a veil piercing because it was you know, accidents happen and, and harm can come to people through, you know, the, uh, the, it's, it's the purpose of the law to assign blame and negligence, but the, the potential is there that they're really, it, it, it was minor, right? It was a minor incident. And how is that plaintiff going to be compensated for their injuries? Give them an easier way to do it than having to go and, and pierce the veil and come after your personal assets. Okay. And some of these things Jonathan is talking about, you know, we've got law in, in the normal sense with real estate law, and then we have retirement law. If you remember, some people know very well about this rule because they have to look at it. Some people are newer to it. Self-dealing means you always want to keep IRA funds or anything coming from your IRA specific to just your IRA. Just like Jonathan was saying, almost like think of an LLC as another person. Think of your IRA and all activity withheld in it as another person. You don't want to start jumbling this together. You don't want to take a coffee from your self-directed IRA account. You don't want to buy an Uber to take your, um, your family across town. If you the, keep those separate, you're going to stay clear of that self-dealing rule. And you'll also be more in touch with the um, separation of that LLC business. So there's a couple questions um, about like a parent LLC and then a sub LLC that we had in the Q&A. So mm -hmm. the first answer that um, you know, someone asks is, you know, can I have a lower LLC below my Colorado and my rocket dollar IRA? And that answer is yes, you can. Um, some of our investors, lucky enough, they just are in Colorado. Um, we use Colorado because they're quick, they're quick, they're easy to work with. They're very tech enabled for a state department so that people ask why, that's why we use them. And um, people can use that Colorado LLC if they're in Colorado or they could open a local LLC below them. So we'll have some investors that will just do one or two LLCs below it. We'll have some investors that have many different properties. They'll open um, you know, 10, five, 16 LLCs below our accounts. So uh, I would say when I talk to kind of the grizzled real estate veterans, there's a lot of them that say, hey, I'm opening an LLC for every single property. No ifs, ands, buts are out. Uh, um, no ifs, ands, or buts, I'm doing it. Um, and then I have some people that this is their first investment. They've only done one. And they say, hey, I'm, I'm fine sticking to just the Colorado LLC. You're re registering that as an entity doing business in Illinois or Florida. Mm -hmm. So Jonathan, what is... Um, what do you see as far as people opening like an LLC for every single property? Is that overkill or is that a really smart uh, possible strategy? So, so, so one of the interesting things here is, right, you've got a Colorado LLC. You're going to register that as a foreign ent entity in Illinois and sort of that hypothetical you just threw out there. Yeah. What does it cost to register your Colorado entity in Illinois? You know what? It's yeah. the, almost the exact same cost as if you just formed a subsidiary, right? So you're not saving anything. Uh, it would be a wholly owned subsidiary. It's a disregarded entity for tax purposes. So there's no tax filing there. Yes, it's a separate set of books and records you need to keep because we do need, if we want the uh, limited liability protection, it needs to be treated as separate from its parent company. But that means it opens a bank account. It has its own general ledger, rents come in, expenses go out. It keeps its own uh, 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 books and records, business records and, and financial records. And then at the end of the day, end of the month, end of the quarter, Profits are passed up into the holding company, which is the Colorado LLC. I think that's a superior structure than taking your Colorado LLC and registering it as a foreign entity in multiple other states. Here's why. We talked about veil piercing. Does laws vary from state to state? Some states it's easier. Sometimes uh, they, there's more sympathetic uh, uh, tenants potentially that you're dealing with. And mm -hmm. the likelihood of a veil piercing happening may be higher in Illinois or California or Florida. When you have now this double layer of protection, they're not only going to have to pierce the veil, maybe you screwed up and you were using the Illinois LLC to get Ubers across town. They could pierce the veil there, but now they're in the Wyoming holding company. Did you screw up there too? <laughs> you, you effectively mm -hmm. get another bite at the apple yeah. in this way. They'd have to pierce the veil twice to get to the pot of gold, which is going to be where all your crypto or stocks and bonds is or, or whatever else up inside your uh, top level LLC. So I, I always recommend uh, having a multi-layer structure 
uh, for real estate or and, and, and any risky endeavor where there's a mm-hmm. probability of, of litigation. And then there's a probability of, especially given the complexity of, of running real estate, you could make a mistake somewhere along the way and open up a door for veil piercing. Now, when it comes to how many properties to put inside of a particular LLC, that's a matter of, a, a matter of judgment. Um, uh, the, the, the example I like to use is, you know, you're in uh, uh, Illinois and you own four condos in one building. They are fairly low value, 150,000 each kind of condos. Uh, community area or common area is where some of the liability would occur. That's where the pool is or the gym or other things. Think about what is the liability within the four walls of each unit? Probably fairly low, right? And so that you, you, you have the choice, you know, insure against that risk, or create four LLCs inside of this. Each condo has its own LLC. That creates a lot of headache. I think in in a situation like that, where there's low liability, the property is a low liability property, I'm okay with commingling some of those properties into one LLC. I I, I personally have a number, you know, $250,000 is the maximum amount of equity I want at risk in any single LLC. Because we think about how litigation occurs, they sue, they're going to be paid by the um, uh, insurance carrier first. If they're not satisfied, they're going, all the assets inside that LLC are going to be subject to the claims of those creditors. They get that $250,000 of equity. Hopefully that's enough to satisfy them that they don't need to try to pierce the veil. We've, we've created that additional layer of protection with the second LLC, but what are you comfortable losing in that single LLC? Because whatever the equity is, that is going to be easy access for that plaintiff to get if they're not satisfied by the insurance. So uh, I also, if, if you have sort of riskier properties, right, properties with, uh, it's not in a condo complex, it's maybe a multi-story with a balcony, or it has a pool, or it has a hot tub, or it's got a swing set in the backyard, or it's an older property where there may be some, you know, electrical problems, or there may be carbon monoxide problems, or there might be a uh, uh, radon, you know, all of lead paint, something like that. In those cases, I like to think about the risk. How much risk is there associated with this individual piece of property? And do I want to isolate it from other properties? Okay. Yeah. And, you know, thank you for asking that because that is a question we get every single day. And some customers just go, oh, I just want to do the Colorado. It seems easier. It really does depend state to state on cost. Um, Texas is one of them where it's honestly not very smart to register as a foreign entity. It is much more, way more affordable to actually just open a Texas LLC. I believe they tr- did that on purpose here in the state, to just try and sell those Texas LLCs. Um, and it's always something our customers consider as they look how many properties they have. So that answer will hopefully be able to use that and send that out to a lot of different customers. So um, Han asked a, a question. I have an answer for this one is, how do I go about creating a series LLC under my Rocket Dollar Roth Colorado IRA LLC? Do I do it inside Rocket Dollar? And the question is, uh, no, Rocket Dollar does not help with directly anything below our Colorado LLC. Everything kind of beyond that is up to our customers. Some of them will go do that themselves. That's why we're having a webinar today. Feel free to talk with Jonathan's firm about that. So the, basically that is where you do it. Our customers will either go create it themselves or they will go to a lawyer and have some assistance with that. Um, especially if you have complex structures, uh, you know, does it make sense for a $5,000 Roth IRA? Maybe not. But as you get up in assets, it is wise to consider legal help. And I've always encouraged customers that are a little grumpy about it. They're like, ah, I don't want to do that. Like once you're getting up in assets there, it is wise to consider legal help. Consider your structure. How is all that real estate held? Where is the liability? Is it spread out enough? Or do you potentially need to look at that structure? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and, and if I could talk just for a moment about series LLCs, I, 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 we actually uh, do a, a lot, uh, form a lot of series LLCs. They are permitted under uh, Wyoming law, where we do a lot of formations, and and they're uh, they're inherently complex. I think a lot of people don't understand them, and we we actually put a little bit of a warning on our on our uh, Wyoming LLC attorney website, which says you're on your own. You can schedule a call with an attorney. We recommend. You know, you can schedule a call with me for half an hour at a time, $150. We can talk about your particular issues. And the end of it, uh, uh, my goal is to give you actionable uh, advice. 
And so at, at the, uh, with a series LLC, you know, I found folks who will, who will form a Wyoming series LLC and then attempt to use those series to hold property in multiple different states, right? Registering them as foreign entities sometimes, sometimes they'll just try to use them in another state. And, and I'm, I'm very wary of that. There's such a new LLC form. There's such a new entity form. There's not a lot of case law and we're not sure what it's going to take to, you know, we talk about piercing the veil and getting to the members are uh, the owners of an LLC with series LLCs. My concern is you've got series one, two, three, four, five. Are they going to be able to pierce across and take the sister or brother LLCs assets as well? And there's also a tendency for folks to say, well, it's a series LLC. So I can sort of treat them together and, and their assets together. And they wind up commingling across the, the sisters. Uh, that is going to, that's absolutely going to lead to a veil piercing across, right? Mm -hmm. So each one even if you're solely in a single state that recognizes series LLC and you've got 10 pieces of rental property that are each in their own series, right? They have to have their own bank account. They have to collect their own rents. They have to pay their own expenses. If you're just trading as one big pot, you, you basically have a regular LLC holding all of those assets. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that, um, that case law term is a good one we use here at Rocket Dollar as well. Some people ask like, why doesn't Rocket Dollar do this? Or why don't you, know, you recommend people do this? The lack of case law is uh, versus strong case law is sometimes where we'll steer people down a certain path. Because Rocket yeah. Dollar, we really can't provide legal advice. The best we'll do is say, look, this is the case law and this is stuff is out there. You can review it and review the information. Uh, when there's a lack of case law, the risk is a lot harder to judge. It's much more unknown. And just so you know, that's the you know if it's the IRS or if it's other um, uh, legal challenges, as more precedence precedence gets pushed out, then gradually that risk becomes more available and more able to be easily judged. When there's a little to no case law, you, you're kind of walking around in the gray area. It's not good to be doing that in a you know high asset IRA. Uh, with an IRA, um, you know, if you make a prohibited transaction, this is why people, we tell people not to go in a gray area with no case law. If the IRS decides, hey, this new asset, like NFTs are a new one with crypto, I'm going to buy a bunch of NFTs in my IRA. The IRS doesn't say I can't do it. However, there's not any case law on NFTs yet, but there's a lot on collectibles. Mm -hmm. Something like that, if you're going into that gray area and you, you, you think, hey, you're going into either gray area or you don't look at old laws, a similar case law, that can bite you in the butt later on. Be, be, being the test case is, is typically expensive. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I want them to look at the case law and be like, I have no shot of winning, right? And, and, and then the suit won't be brought. But if they're like, man, it's 50-50 NFTs. Maybe it's a collectible. Maybe it's a, a security. Let's, let's give it a shot. Uh, yeah. You don't want to be that test case. There are people that go do challenge this test case and they are a special breed. There are people that are well prepared. They have many uh, lawyers like Jonathan helping out and assisting them. So this is not one that you should say, hey, I've got $150,000 in an IRA. I'm going to push the fence and see how far I could get. Let someone else get buzzed by the fence. Then in a couple of years, you can come in later when it's much more clear and you have a better idea how to do it. Um, so Clint had a question. My question is pertaining to ranches. Each ranch would possibly be located in different states. So Jonathan, I believe you'd say in this situation, someone should possibly open a Texas LLC and a Wyoming and a Colorado if there's, let's say those are the three states. Well, the, 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 the question is whether a ranch is doing business in a particular state, right? So each state has different laws about what constitutes doing business in the state. Most of them sort of rhyme, but some of them are different. So uh, in most merely owning property, uh, within the borders of a particular state does not subject that LLC to registration as a foreign entity. Colorado LLC buys a piece of dirt in Texas, doesn't do anything with it. It's fenced off, but there's nothing going on in it. The argument would be that that entity does not need to register as a foreign entity in the state of Texas. There are exceptions. California is a great exception. If there is a uh, foreign LLC, say you got a, a Colorado LLC, which owns a piece of dirt in California, owning property, real or personal, so real estate or a boat uh, in, in California with a value in excess of a certain amount subjects that 
to uh, a foreign anti-registration. I'm not licensed in California, I'm not licensed in Texas, but this is sort of the general area of law that we're looking at all of the time. And so I can provide you with some guidance on it. So is the ranch engaging in business activities? Is it doing business within the state of, of uh, Texas? I, I, I don't know, that's gonna be a fact specific. Um, uh, you, you may wanna consult with, again, if it's a piece of dirt, you're, you, you got a trailer on it or a, 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 a building, Fine. No, probably not. If you got buildings on there and you're doing glamping, right, or, or you're you're offering horseback rides, I would say absolutely yeah. file it as a foreign entity in California. And and if we think about, you know, what is foreign entity registration about? Uh, what is the formation of LLCs about? Foreign entity registration in particular. It, it, the state's goal is to give its citizens an easy way to sue an entity that's uh, potentially harming people within the state. So uh, if, if you could form a Colorado LLC and have it doing all sorts of business in Texas and someone were harmed in Texas, that plaintiff would potentially have to go all the way to Colorado to sue. And the state says, that's, that's not right. We want to make it easy to sue businesses which are operating within our borders. And that's what the foreign entity registration is all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so Clint said, hey, you know, farming, grazing and hunting, this is stuff that's going on the land. That seems like business activity, especially if other guests are coming on to do that. Right. Yeah. Hunting and, is the scary one if yeah, you're bringing with, outside guests on. With liability. Um, and so that's a common thing. You know, people ask like, hey, I just bought a piece of property. Do I have to get this done, you know, today or do I have to register that foreign entity today? Generally, this um, when someone's getting a tenant, you know, that is one of the big marquee moments where you better have all your stuff prepared on your structure before a tenant gets in there or very, very quickly afterwards. You do not want to be having tenants in your properties without all of these liability protections figured out. Um, all right. So we got a California question. We get a lot of California questions. Unfortunately, California's, um, like you said, the idea of business activity, the bar is very low. If your toe goes over it, California wants their 800 bucks a year. And sometimes they want a lot of reporting as well. So this is um, Lewis asked, I live in California. Um, California strict view of business management and operation activities that are conducted in California. Do I need to file and register in California? Does the SDIRA LLC form in California qualify for exemption from the annual $800 fee? A lot of people ask about this exemption from the fee. The short answer is California does not care. If they see an LLC with any activity, they're gonna go for it. They're gonna ask you for the $800. We are doing a nice update to um, you know, our no LLC IRA. We have some great news coming out that really soon that is really aimed at California customers so that they can skip the LLC and go into small alternative assets. However, that, that direct custody IRA is always a little bit limited. The reason why people uh, tar target us and say, hey, do you have an LLC IRA, a bank control IRA, is they want to be able to do the creative real estate. They want to be able to get a property whenever they want. They want a lot of freedom from the custodian to go pick that property. So direct custody IRA does kind of um, clamp down your choice, but the LLC IRA is really get that flexibility. So Jonathan, anything else on that California law? I haven't seen many people been able to get out of that. A lot of people think they can. <laughs> and then that scary notice shows up in the mail uh, a few months later. Yeah. No, we, we've been, uh, this, is, this is not applicable, <laughs> but on uh, uh, for California citizens who have like real estate in Texas and Oklahoma and Colorado, many of them are going with a, um, a Wyoming corporation as a, uh, as sort of a tax blocker. So nothing is showing up on the California citizens tax returns. It's all captured within the um, corporation. Uh, there, there is uh, the, the rules for corporations when they need to register as a foreign entity are different than they are for LLCs. Mm -hmm. And so it's not as long as it doesn't have employees, uh, it can have board members, um, but its mere existence is not going to subject it to foreign entity registration uh, okay. there. So a lot of folks using that. Yeah, to finish this Lewis's question, a lot of people mm -hmm. ask like, hey, I work at Rock, Rocket Dollar. Why is my, I live in Florida. Why is, why is my LLC not Florida? Why is my LLC not California? I live in Illinois. And the answer is at the start of Rocket Dollar, we work with every single state department in the entire country. And a little bit of a spoiler, it was a complete nightmare. Some, some state departments, very responsive, very on time, answering our calls and questions. Other state departments were very slow. 
uh, the fees range wildly across the whole country. So we're trying to sell a really affordable product. And someone would say, I paid 360 and all of a sudden my fees are double now. What happened? Well, the LLC you asked for was a lot more expensive. Um, as I mentioned, one of the last things, Colorado, they, they, they are very tech enabled, much more so than our state departments. They answer our calls. When we ask for questions or to redo things, a mistake, they are very quick on the draw to get it fixed for us. So it's mostly operational, but we do allow after the Colorado LLC, you have full authority to pick whatever you want after it um, to customize that for your own state um, or your own service. Um, I'm just reading a question here. Yeah, and so on. Uh, so Han is asking, you know, this will kind of be a good pivot into the crypto topic. We're about halfway through. Um, Han is saying, uh, you know, I'm thinking about an LLC for real estate, and then I'm also having some crypto investments. And then, you know, he has some other, maybe some other investments in startups. So let's say there's three different assets, real estate, mm -hmm. startups, and crypto. Is there, you know, a really a need, that, let's just say super basic investing, we can get into more complex stuff later. Is there really a need to open an LLC in addition to the Colorado one for the startup and the crypto investments? Because there's not as much outside liability from my perspective. Yeah, is, is it a liability uh, producing activity? Uh, if it's not, then, um, you know, we, we, we run into this a lot of different context. Uh, does that asset interact with the world in some way where it could produce some liability, even if it's, you know, fairly hypothetical? Uh, if you're investing in stocks and bonds, absolutely not, right? There's no liability associated with that. If you're investing in just crypto, I, I don't see any uh, liability associated with that. Investing in, in businesses, is it possible uh, yeah, there's some, there's some possibility there. And, and some, one of the examples is, you, you know, your, uh, how is your IRA going to be titled? Uh, that is going to show up in the business records of the company in which you're investing. And, and it's a, um, uh, it, it's sort of a terrible example, but imagine that you're a co-investor with, with Jeffrey Epstein, right? And your name is listed there, or your IRA's name is listed there, instead of something, an LLC that's fairly innocuous, it doesn't show uh, that you're the owner, but it's, you know, John Finiac's IRA is the investor, XYZ custodian uh, is the investor in this startup company, and it goes horribly wrong, and there's lawsuits, and, uh, or it goes bankrupt. Um, you're going to be associated with those other investors as an individual, which can be potentially problematic. It could, you know, reflect badly upon you. When people do a search, they say, whoa, this guy makes bad business in, in decisions. Look at this company went belly up or whoa, he's an investor with this scurrilous, absolutely horrible person. He was your business partner. How could you even do that? Right? So the, 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 there's the privacy aspect with, uh, of investing, investing with an LLC that I think is uh, potentially under, uh, underutilized. Uh, your name won't appear as an individual on the register of shareholders of that startup company, which there is a benefit to. You have to make your own decision about that. On the crypto or purely uh, financial assets, I say, that's fine. You, you don't yeah. hold them in an LLC, but I don't want my name listed as an individual on uh, the register of a company. Yeah. So um, for our customers, they can upgrade to the gold account. They can get a custom LLC name and that helps with some of the privacy, but we have some, some people are not concerned about it at all. Some are very concerned about it. Yeah. So I say, if you're very concerned about it, that is a situation where you could talk to Jonathan's team, check out the Wyoming LLC. Of course, there's many different other states as well, but um uh, so a lot of our customers, to, to finish Hans' question, they'll have real estate protected in an extra LLC. So they'll have the Colorado, they'll put real estate in a certain local LLC, and then they will add no extra protections to um, the, uh, the, their crypto or their, their stocks or their other more um, non-liability assets. And um, that's another question people ask, like, I have an LLC. Why won't you let me put it in at Rocket Dollar? I have an LLC I made five years ago. I had an LLC, I just sat around and did nothing. Why can't I just started with Rocket Dollar? Why can't I use that? And that's really just for to protect uh, the customer liability is when you first approach us, you know, Rocket Dollar customer we've just met, we have no idea what's been going on in that LLC. Could be great. You could have done everything perfectly. You could have made it two weeks ago, uh, or you could be doing some other stuff that could potentially lead to some liability, prohibited transaction issues down the road. 
The reason why we kind of standardize that and make that Colorado the same way every time, um, or you know, the custom LLC name with the Colorado, is just to protect the customers uh, from stuff that they might still be learning on. We don't want them to use it, to tell us to use an LLC uh, when one maybe when they made themselves, and then maybe that something was mistaken about that opening process. Um, all right, and so. Jonathan, we uh, last time we talked when we talked on the phone before this webinar, we had a really great conversation. A lot of crypto investors. This is a super big FAQ people have. Yeah. They'll 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 use their LLC um, and they'll go open um, uh, an account in a cryptocurrency exchange like Gemini or Coinbase. They'll be using that, and then they'll say, "Hey, I really want to take the crypto off the exchange. Um, I really want to move this to other places." And the reason why I bring this up is it is very important that everyone that ever looks at your IRA knows that every asset is owned by the IRA. If the IRS mm -hmm. ever starts to see issues with that, your issues can go from small to very large very quickly. Um, so how have you, you, I know you've talked to a few investors about yeah. this, about this subject. Yeah. How, how, how do you prove that you own an asset which doesn't have a document of title attached to it? All right, I can prove I own a car, Here's my, my title certificate. I, I can prove I own a, an account. My name is on it and it's attached to me. I can prove I own a piece of real estate. There's a title record that's in the, uh, in the public records with the county in which the property is located. How do I prove that I own a, a Picasso? Well, I, I, is there a document of title associated with it? I'm, I'm sure there is, right? Possession is nine tenths of the law, but if I've got a document of title as, uh, associated and, and, and in, uh, uh, in conjunction with some sort of document of title, I can say, this is mine. Here's why it's mine. Here's the date it became mine. Here's a, a verifiable proof. And I feel very comfortable with that in terms of drawing a line in the sand um, and being able to sit, I, you know, I call it sort of the sweat on the brow test. Uh, if I'm being audited and it's being investigated, what, what do I own or what does my uh, IRA own? Do I have something that is incontrovertible? Um, uh, we, we have developed a, you know, digital asset sale and assignment agreement. And it, it basically is saying that this digital asset, and it could be just the wallet is the digital asset. This wallet is wholly owned by this specific LLC. Wallet one, two, three, here's my public key for it, is owned by this LLC. And then if you buy the uh, tokens on an exchange and move them into this wallet, you're just moving it from the LLC's right hand to its left hand. Now you better be able to establish a chain of custody that that is going to be searchable all the transactions that's the beauty of the you know the public blockchain all the transactions on that um, uh, wallet are going to be forever indelibly available for viewing by the IRS auditor or whoever else right so you say set up this wallet it has nothing in it this wallet with this uh, as assignment of of asset is going to be wholly the only or the only ownership of this is with this LLC. And then you're going to be able to show every transaction was only with the LLC. It went from the Coinbase account, LLC account, goes into the private uh, wallet, the, the off uh, chain wallet. It sits there and then you moved it into an account with uh, someone else, Bitrix or someone else. And then you moved it back into your wallet and then it went out. And all those transactions that were going to show a chain of title for those digital assets that never goes into your personal possession. And you have that, I, I recommend a, a notarization of that document. And uh, we offer uh, um, uh, uh, services for our LLCs where you, know, you can store documents and, and uh, have them where they're effectively held with a third party custodian at that point, a document custodian. And that, that, that can go a long way. Um, it, it shows that you know what you're doing if you're audited, and it also uh, will uh, take away those questions. You're going to feel confident on that audit, but you you better not mess around and try to yeah. do something uh, in that and, wallet. And I have had hundreds and hundreds of conversations about what Jonathan just talked about. I love how succinctly you put that because the, you know there's a lot of uh, questions that people throw back that I have kind of answers to. One of them is, you know, there's blockchain records. Why isn't that good enough? And again, the sweat on the brow test, if you're sitting around and you're getting audited and they're going through all of your crypto transactions and you're like, no, 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 this, 
you, you know, you're, you're trying to explain a Hansel and Gretel breadcrumbs trail of elaborate creation mm -hmm. of where all your crypto transactions are. And frankly, they're, they're not buying it or they're not having fun doing it. Is that going to make you more nervous? Uh, you know, you really want as much backup as possible, especially if you have a larger IRA in crypto. Um, and Rocket Dollar, we've been trying to make people aware of this issue and also push our customers to people that have solutions to this issue. Because this is, we mentioned in the beginning, this is an issue that has little to no case law. We only have older assets, like maybe precious metals to look at. So things come up like physical possession. Is crypto physically possessed on a hardware device or is it in the blockchain? Crypto investors have a strong opinion that it's not, but will the IRS see a device any differently? We don't know, there's not a case law on it. Right. So in the absence of this laws in these gray areas, it's good to take steps to protect your IRA. Um, it's good to get out ahead of it. Um, and we've communicated this to some of the wallet companies like MetaMask and other companies, they were receptive to it, but just know, you know, this could be months or even years before they find a way to really properly document uh, that wallet. And what Jonathan is talking about is when you go off to a private wallet, wallets have no uh, know your customer checks, as the financial uh, industry calls them. Coinbase verifies your identity. They check your LLC. They check that it exists at the, at the state of Colorado. Our partner Gemini will do that. They will verify the LLC. All of our crypto partners will verify that the LLC exists uh, first. Aristex goes through that process for professional and quickly over a few days. And then after they're ready, then they approve you and let you online. The problem is that that there's, if, if an, an agent kind of enforcement doubts that your wallet is yours and you've done no, none of, the, of this other, other work, you cannot go back to Gemini, you cannot go back to Coinbase, you can't go back to AirSax and saying, I'm having trouble, they don't believe this wallet is mine. You're right now, you're in a decentralized crypto experience. There's no one else to really back you up except the blockchain. There's no human to kind of sit there and raise their hand and say, hey, I verify all this information, I work with this customer, what they're doing here, um, this is their wallet that's connected to their LLC. So using that strategy like Jonathan's talking about can help you give some extra defense um, in a place where there is not that much other than the blockchain. As the IRS figures out how they're going to enforce crypto, you don't want the blockchain to be your only defense. You want to have other things ready to kind of prove your activity uh, and what you're doing with your wallet and your account. Yeah, a, a signed, notarized piece of paper. It's uh, it's it's old school, but I I love the idea of being in there and you're like, all right, here's all the registers and, and assuming that uh, auditor is going to know what they're looking at and so what's this wallet it went into and boom here here it is here here's the here yeah. here is where this wallet was established as an asset of the LLC. Yeah, you're uh, the. the you know, what I'm telling customers is like, look, you got, you're, you're in the new game. You're in a game that's running very quickly. And sometimes, you know, the law takes a little bit of time to catch up to that. You got to play the old game as well. If you're playing both games at the same time, you're going to be better defended. You're going to be better prepared. Um, you're hopefully going to have a better time if God forbid an audit ever comes. You're not going to be sweating bullets. And another thing I tell someone is like, look, if you can't produce records in 24 hours that are simple, easy to understand, and easy to uh, explain, you should not be doing that stuff in crypto if you can't quickly produce that for your IRA. Um, just think about that mentally. And you know, we have some people that will just do one wallet. Uh, and then I've talked to some people that want to do 14 or 15 different DeFi protocols, um, 30 or 40 different cryptos. And just say, look, keep it simple in an IRA, keep it easy to explain in the gray area. Don't take excessive risks um, until some of that stuff becomes more clear. Um, any other questions from the audience? Um, we had a few good ones earlier on real estate. Um, and okay, we just had one come in here. Uh, so uh, Hannah asked, is, you know, does Jonathan's firm do notice notarization of something that's say a Gemini, Gemini institutional wallet or account assets? So uh, where I really think someone should go to Jonathan is if you are, you know, if you're at a centralized exchange, know there's a, there's a big difference between a centralized exchange and a private wallet. Coinbase has Coinbase wallet, but it is technically really just Coinbase offering a private wallet. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so Coinbase is closely monitoring everything in the exchange. And then the Coinbase wallet is just another wallet. Just uh, forgive me, technically or not, but it's it's private and it's separated. So if you're on a centralized exchange, I think you're fine. That, that exchange is tracking most of your activity and connecting mm -hmm. it directly to your LLC. As soon as you start coming off the exchange, again, if you're dealing with $2,000 in an IRA, you know, some people are okay with that risk. If you're getting to bigger assets, you should really consider this. If you have, you know, hundred, two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand dollars in assets, you're like, I'm not paying taxes on any of this. If the IRS comes to you and says, why did you not pay taxes? We, this blockchain record doesn't mess up. What would happen in these other three transactions? So uh, Daniel asked, can I use a nano ledger or cold storage for my crypto? And that was kind of what we've been discussing. Mm -hmm. Nothing in the law says you can't. However, um, like Jonathan is talking about reducing liability and reducing risk. If you're stuck with a wallet and you have it in your house and you plug it in and you trade some personal crypto on it by mistake, all of a sudden the conversation years later could become much more intense. If uh, we, it sounds ludicrous, but we tell say, if you put in a safety deposit box, you are keeping it outside of your home. Sounds totally ludicrous, very impractical, <laughs> but the IRS has never really liked people storing assets like Picasso paintings, classic cars, collectibles, precious metals inside their home because they feel like the investor is a little bit too close to it. So this is, <laughs> this is people have asked, is there a yes or no? Can I do a cold wallet? And we basically say, look, if, if you're prepared for the risks, it's a gray area, you can buy a wallet with the IRA. However, if you're going to be careless, if you're not going to be reading these rules, you're not going to take preparation, you should probably be avoiding um, ledger wallets and cold storage wallets. That usually helps most of our customers decide what side they're on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that this, and it, yeah, someone asked like, why would I need to keep all these records if I was uh, inside a non-taxable IRA? And the question is, it's really how complex is the stuff you're doing? Uh, sweat in the proud, sweat in the brow test again. If it takes two seconds to describe all your assets in an IRA, where they're owned and why they're non-taxable, you don't have to worry. As you start to get many more properties, lots of business activity. Um, if you have crypto spread out all over the place, you need to make sure that your records are uh, immaculate and um, always prepared. Marisha asked, if it, I think this was back when the Pierce the Veil question got asked at the beginning, but it just says, does the company have to be profitable to be pierced? I believe that was in the context that it was asked. No, no, it doesn't have to be uh, uh, profitable to be pierced. I, I mean, if it's a, you know, if it continues to lose money, uh, is it a mere shell in some way? Uh, if it has no assets in it um, and everything is, is sort of going immediately out the door, that that's, especially with a sympathetic plaintiff, you're not giving that plaintiff uh, anything to sort of latch onto. But there's there's plenty of businesses that for, for decades can, can sort of be money losing. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's okay. W what, what's exactly going on inside uh, the LLC? I mean, honestly, if it's a, a money losing business inside of your LLC, you're not getting any of the advantage. You may be better off flowing those losses out on, you know, move that business somehow out of the LLC or start it up somewhere else. Yeah. And then <laughs> buy that business in your personal funds, <laughs> right. uh, sell it from your IRA and then write the losses off. Right. right. Um, so we talked about a lot today, Jonathan, you know, we got about like nine minutes left. What are some common issues that maybe we didn't talk about a lot that, you know, your customers come to you every day, every week? I, I, I think there's something to be said for don't get too complicated too quickly. Uh, these are complex structures. Uh, you're already with an, an IRA LLC. You're already hitting a level of complexity there uh, that, uh, for some of my clients, it, it scares me because, you know, there's people who want to do things. I'm like, that's a prohibited transaction. You're going to have UBTI. It's not going to work. Like, like mm -hmm. the, the, there are so many ways that it won't work. So, so, so get your feet wet slowly with these things, get comfortable, go through a couple of tax seasons, have your, uh, a CPA that you uh, know and trust review what it is you're doing. And then as you're feeling more confident, it sort of becomes, there's this idea of, you know, there's the uh, incompetence and then you go to conscious competence and then there's 
unconscious competence, right? When you're getting to the unconscious competence, we don't have to think about it. Whenever you do something, you keep the records, you know where the, you know, you've got your multiple credit cards in, in your, in your uh, wallet and for business expenses related to the LLC and, and, and you're just doing it. At that point, start increasing your complexity level. Um, I, I, I think if everyone started with that and some people, they get to the point and they're like, this is just not worth it, right? They don't enjoy the, mm -hmm. the labor intensive aspects of this, but they built this whole complex structure that now it's like trying to disassemble the Empire State Building. It's incredibly They've difficult. They created a monster. <laughs> they have. And so take it slow, get comfortable, begin to build. And, and then as you're, 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 you're building this structure, you're always thinking about the asset protection component of it. Do I need another LLC? What's the nature of this act activity? What are the real risks of it? And what else can I do to protect this pot of gold at the top at your, in your uh, LLC, the liquid stuff that everyone wants to get to when you've got mm -hmm. liability happening down here? Yeah, and, and this is part of the product launch that we're doing is that direct custody IRA is kind of for the customers getting their feet wet. They need a little bit more. As I say, uh, the bowling analogy, the bumpers are up for their, some of their first alternative investments. And then, you know, we have a lot of hardcore customers that love the IRA LLC, but it is not right for everyone. You know, sometimes throwing this, someone's like, why do I have an LLC? I'm immediately confused. I just want an alternative in my IRA. We're trying to address that. We're trying to bring out a similar right. product for those people. And, um, you know, hopefully with those two products now, that one that's launching next week, that's going to let you know, our customers ease and wet their feet wet. Uh, try out a passive investment first. Try out something very simple. Um, avoid the ultra complex one. Keep reading, keep uh, looking at blogs. Then in a few years, when that, hopefully if that investment has done well, you can go into a much more active investment and structure. Um, so uh, thank you, Jeff. It's great to have this. Uh, we have Jeff asked saying he had a great time watching this. Um, so someone asked, you know, is there a website where I can find CPAs who are familiar with this stuff and some crypto investments? So we have a uh, foreign email the sales team sends that has a bunch of uh, lawyers and CPAs that have expertise in this area. Jonathan, we're going to be happy to add you to that um, as one of the resources. So we've thought about putting it on the website, but we really prefer to just do that in private. So mm -hmm. um, I can send that through info at Rocket Dollar. And it's true. It is tough to find expertise in lawyers and CPAs that know crypto. It's like an old school knowledge with a very new technology. Mm -hmm. um, so Jonathan, I'm really happy to have you on today. Um, Han, please feel free to uh, follow up over email. Uh, and Jonathan, how should people get in touch with you? I know you have Cloud Peak and a couple of sub brands. Yeah. If they want yeah, to approach you, there's, there's probably the easiest uh, Wyoming LLC attorney.com or Colorado LLC attorney.com. You can go in there and there's a contact uh, uh, link in there um, and you can uh, schedule time with me. Uh, our folks will get back to you and say schedule time. A lot of them can answer your questions, which is about. You know, if you wanted to open up a subsidiary underneath the Colorado LLC that Rocket Dollar is forming for you, um, uh, we can assist with with that. Our customer service team, if you want to talk with me or some of our other attorneys, you can schedule time really easily on a you know half hour increments. Um, so that that's the best way. Check out our websites. Okay, awesome. I just linked just so I'm going to leave it up for a little bit before we close the webinar. Wyoming uh, attorney LLC.com is there. Wyoming, Wyoming LLC attorney.com. I didn't look at what you wrote. Wyoming. Uh, uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. Just want to make sure it's the right yeah. one, not sending you somewhere else. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, thank you so much for attending. Again, we always put this on YouTube. Um, so feel free to share this one. We, we had, um, we had, we had a few people attend today, but the amount of questions about this topic is way bigger than the people that attended just for today. So please feel free to share this one around. We're going to be blasting this recording out a lot. Um, thank you so much, Jonathan. Have a great Thank day. you. All right.